to welcome you to today's webinar program uh, regarding the Paycheck Protection Program forgiveness elements. Um, this is a, a follow up on some a number of programs we've had previously with our representatives of the uh, SBA. So we want to thank them for, for being a part of this again to help clarify some issues that have certainly emerged uh, among our various uh, chamber members. Uh, we are doing this program once again uh, on a regional basis, uh, coordinating with our regional Chamber of Commerce partners, including the Back Mountain Chamber, uh, Carbondale Chamber, uh, Greater Hazleton, Pike County, Greater Pittston, Schoolkill, Greater Wilkes-Barre, and Wyoming County Chambers of Commerce. So uh, as always, we try to do this in, in a regional fashion so that we can maximize the positive impact on all of our businesses throughout Northeastern Pennsylvania. A uh, couple of housekeeping elements I want to share with you. First, we're going to be muting everybody on this call. However, if you do have questions, you can use the chat function. Uh, and your questions, uh, of course, we have a lot of people that are going to be on this call. May not be able to get to all the questions, but uh, the uh, presenters will do their best to be able to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, we'll also be recording the event. So um, if something moves by quickly or you think you missed something, remember you can come to um, our website. Uh, or any of our social media platforms to access this information after the program. Uh, and um, we'll do our best to make sure that we provide this to others as well as the people participating on this program. Uh, so we have a lot to cover. Uh, I'm going to be passing the baton here to Victoria Rogers. Victoria is uh, one of the newest employees here at the Scranton Chamber, but certainly a, a veteran on the communications and uh, 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 elements of, uh, of this region uh, through previous professional experience. So she is the uh, membership and community relations specialist at the Greater Scranton Chamber of Commerce. I'm going to pass it on to Victoria Rogers. Thank you everyone again. We want to welcome our presenters from the Office of the Eastern District Office of her Small Business Administration. Today we have the Lead Economic Development Specialist, Mr. Rob Goza and we have Wilma Bonilla Oliver. She's our Lender Relations and Economic Development Specialist. So welcome both and thank you so much. Rob? Ah, I think I had the mute on. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Thank you. So, so thanks, uh, Bob and Victoria, for inviting us out um, to to talk about this. Obviously, um, I, I think my agency used to be uh, referred to as the best kept secret in government. Um, all, and now, with everything that's gone on, I think we might uh, might be uh, more well known than ever before in our history. Um, the Small Business Administration is, a, is an agency of the federal government. Our, our whole mission is to help small businesses start, grow, and succeed. Um, as you can see here, um, there's a whole lot of information constantly being updated uh, on the CARES Act. Um, I, I think it's important for everybody to try and stay up to date on that. I will be honest, though, um, even I am probably not completely 100% up to date because as things change, uh, they filter down to us and, and to lenders pretty quickly. Um, but and, and we try to stay on top of that. But there's obviously been multiple revisions to the CARES Act, uh, various pieces of legislation that followed on from the initial uh, legislation. So these things do change. Um, we do, uh, we, we certainly do try uh, to provide the, the most up to date information that we have. Um, I think things are starting to settle, um, although um, I say that in the midst of obviously a quite a quite a big election and a lot of things going on with that. So um, we'll see see how that all shakes out and uh, what they what Congress may decide to do in the future. Obviously, I can't speculate on that as a federal uh, federal employee, but it's definitely a, a, the biggest program that we've ever engaged in in the history of the agency. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program a little bit because that is actually still open. Um, you could literally go to sba.gov uh, slash disaster and, and apply for an Economic Injury Disaster Loan uh, right now. It's also a very different sort of a program from other uh, disaster loan declarations that we've ever done before um, in that it is 
na it's nationwide. Um, even the September 11th declaration um, was not uh, was not this broad. And it didn't. Uh, and obviously, small businesses are deeply, deeply affected by COVID-19 in a way that, you know, is different than anything, at least that I've ever seen in, in my lifetime. Um, so there are some other programs that are that are in play that I want to just kind of touch on. So right now, there's a one year deferment of payments on any idle loans provided due to COVID-19. Uh, there's an automatic deferment of previous disaster loans. So if you are a homeowner, renter or business, um, you know, through the end of this year, there's a deferment on payments for those. If you have an existing, um, what I refer to as a traditional or regular SBA loan, um, any of those monthly payments um, are being deferred, um, temp what were being deferred temporarily until September 27th. Um, and then the same thing with uh, any new 78504 and SBA microloans. Uh, the two, obviously, the two primary programs here are IDLE and the PPP. So, these are the types of businesses that are eligible to apply, um, which is very, very broad in a way that is different from uh, declarations of the past. Uh, so, small businesses, um, you, you may have noticed that at one point uh, the IDLE program stopped, uh, reopened only to agricultural businesses, and then opened back up to all businesses again. Um, so that's, those are some very, very different things than even disaster declarations from the past. Uh, in this particular uh, situation, private nonprofit organizations, faith-based organizations, and houses of worship are also uh, eligible to apply, uh, as are sole proprietors, independent contractors, and owners of rental property, which if you're familiar with SBA 7A lending and 504 lending, that's a, that's a different sort of a, a thing entirely. Uh, you can qualify for a loan up to $2 million. Most of these loans have been uh, much smaller than that um, and have reached a broad variety of much smaller businesses. Uh, these are the terms because this is a loan. It's 3.75% uh, for a small business, 2.75% for a nonprofit. The loan term is 30 years. And there's no penalty for prepayment. So those are very different loan terms than I think most people are, are used to seeing uh, for a small business type of loan. Uh, the funds can be used on, in a very different way than the Paycheck Protection Program. These are essentially working capital loans that can be used to pay fixed debts, payroll, accounts payable, basically bills that could have been paid had the disaster not occurred. Um, you're not supposed to use it to replace lost sales or profits or to expand. Uh, SBA's idle working capital loans, as I have said repeatedly already, are very different from other SBA loans. Um, you don't go through a bank to apply. You can go straight online. It's a, you'll even, I'll, I even have some slides that will demonstrate um, very briefly what that kind of looks like. There's no, uh, sorry, there's no obligation to take the loan if it's offered. Um, there is collateral required for loans over $25,000. And while there's no real estate collateral required, a blanket UCC one is filed against all of the businesses collateral. Personal guarantees are required if you get a loan greater than $200,000. And applicants can have an existing SBA disaster loan and still qualify for an idle for this disaster. The only difference is that the loans cannot be consolidated. There are some ineligible entities, most of those based on differences between state and federal law in, in certain instances. Um, so businesses involved in an illegal activity at the federal level, specifically marijuana, businesses that derive more than a third of their annual gross revenue from legal gambling activities. Uh, so for instance, if it's a casino or it's a, uh, a convenience store that gets most of its income from, uh, like in Louisiana, for instance, uh, actual slot machines at the at the convenience store or scratchers, lottery tickets, those kinds of things. Um, you're also ineligible if it's a passive business owned by a developer, um, also private clubs and businesses that limber, limit the number of membership for reasons other than capacity. Um, if you're a speculative business or, and this is difficult to define, a business of a prurient sexual nature. So uh, I can't even say that without uh, without trying to envision exactly what that would look like um, without actually trying to envision that, but um, you can probably figure that out on your own. There's three ways to apply. 
Um, really, the only way you should apply, especially if you're able to get to the internet um, and be on this call, is that uh, that web link right there. Um, you can inquire about your the status of this uh, by email here. Uh, you can also call uh, the SBA Customer Service Center. You can even write us a letter. But of those three ways, I would recommend the first two by far. The, the, fir the, the first, uh, the, the web address, the email address, and then, you know, lower down that line if you run into a problem, the customer service center. But I wouldn't try to, to file an application any other way. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize uh, the assistance that our SBA resource partners have been providing. So, for instance, uh, NEPA score. <clears throat> excuse me, has been a huge help to folks, uh, as have the Scranton Small Business Development Center in in uh, in the Scranton Wilkes Bear neck of the woods. Um, you can always find these folks on the web at sba.gov. Um, you can find SBDCs and score chapters uh, contact information pretty easily at those two websites below. So this is kind of what an idle application looks like. It's broken down into the five different pieces with the fifth piece actually just being the summary. And as you can see, it's check the box, check the box, fill in the blank with some very basic information. Um, again, more fill in the blank with some very basic information. As you can see, I'm running through this stuff very quickly. Um, same thing here. Um, and then by that point, you're already to a little bit more fill in the blank. If you have to add an additional owner, you do that. And then there's a few more check the box sorts of things under the additional information. We're already on the fourth step. <clears throat> the fifth step being, oh, and excuse me, there's a, there used to be something called an idle advance uh, that is not currently being offered. Um, but obviously back then, that's what the box you would have checked there. And then you have to fill in obviously where you need the funds routed to. There's a quick summary page of all your answers so you can review to make sure that everything that you've checked and typed in is, is correct. And then you have to prove you're not a robot and then you submit. So um, that pretty much covers uh, in brief the idle program. Um, I will say that uh, when it comes to the PPP loan program and the idle program, we've seen volume in these that are unlike anything else we've ever seen. Um, Interestingly, while we've seen a slight dip in 7A lending, regular 7A SBA lending, we've actually seen an uptick in 504 lending, which is, you know, for for bigger projects and uh, and and that are real, you know, they're sort of like 20, 25 year investments in in future capacity. So that's a very hopeful thing, I think, in my opinion, because the, while the PPP program is designed to keep uh, employees getting paid and to help uh, small businesses, you know, stay above water uh, in the short term, the, which is kind of what 7A loans sort of end up doing, they're working capital types of loans. The PPP loans are actually up this year. And those are loans that are, you know, to me, that's a positive indication of, of what the future holds. At least, uh, at least it's a hopeful note because those are long-term uh, investments. Uh, that with 20 to 25 year uh, return for uh, both the lender and the certified developed corporation that lends the money. So what is the Paycheck Protection Program? Uh, it's a loan. You approach uh, your usually your bank, um, assuming that your bank is a participating lender. Um, most banks are. Uh, it's designed to provide a direct incentive for small businesses to keep their workers on their payroll. Uh, the funds can be used to pay up to eight weeks of payroll costs including benefits. The funds can also be used to pay interest on mortgages, rent, and utilities. There's a very interesting thing about how this particular program has changed uh, over time. So initially, it was fully forgiven when at least 75% of the funds were used for payroll, uh, with forgiveness based on the employer maintaining or quickly rehiring employees and maintaining salary levels. Uh, that shifted to 60% with some follow-on legislation. So there's, depending on when the loans, the loan funds were dispersed, you may fall under 75 or 60. Um, and those are things that, honestly, the the best answer for that is going to be through your lender. They they should be working with you to help you fill out any forgiveness paperwork. Um, 
So the this this is a loan. It has complete loan forgiveness baked into it. Congress did allocate uh, the funds to cover all of the PPP loans that that have been issued. Um, so the expectation is that you know folks will take these loans, follow the rules, and have the those loan dollars uh, forgiven. Uh, but there is obviously a process to that. Even the even the federal government uh, requires uh, some documentation, and and it being the federal government, of course, that documentation is probably nowhere near as simple as any of us would like. Um, but they are trying to uh, to get that paperwork down to something for most borrowers that resembles kind of a 1040 easy type uh, tax form. I don't I, I I hesitate to say that it's it's quite that simple, but it's uh, it's certainly something that that the agency has been attempting to do uh, and, and to get it into uh, as streamlined a process as possible. So when will you owe money? Um, if the borrower uses the loan amount for anything other than payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent and utility payments over the eight weeks after receiving the loan. If the borrower uses less than 75% of the loan amount for payroll costs or the 60% depending, uh, if the borrower maintains staff and payroll less than February 15, 2020 levels, um, then then you may be, and obviously all of these things are subjects ha have been shifted a bit and changed a bit, but that's kind of the, the basic broad shot of this. Uh, to qualify for 100% loan forgiveness, you have to maintain employee headcount for all that for, for full-time employees, you have, you have to maintain salaries and wages, and the borrower uh, would have until June 30th to restore full-time employment and salary levels from any changes made between February 15th and April 26th. There are some caveats to that already. Um, so one is the covered and alternative covered payroll period. So the covered period actually begins on the date the loan proceeds are dispersed and ends eight weeks, 56 days from that date. If, it's the, if it falls under the 24 weeks, uh, it begins on the date the loan proceeds are dispersed and ends 168 days from that date. So depending on when the funds were dispersed will help you figure out uh, which of these uh, buckets essentially that you fall into. Uh, the alternative period uh, is for borrowers with a biweekly or more frequent payroll schedule. Uh, they're allowed to elect the alternative period. Uh, a simple example of that is that the loan is dispersed on August 20th, and the first day of the borrower's first pay period following the disbursement is August 26th, then the first day of the alternative payroll period would be August 26th. For each individual employee, the amount of cash compensation eligible for, for forgiveness uh, isn't allowed to exceed an annual salary of $100,000 prorated for the covered period. So for an eight week covered period, that total would be capped at $15,385 per employee. For a 24 week covered period, that total would be capped at $46,154 per employee. Uh, the owner, employee, self-employed and general partner piece uh, essentially excludes owner employees who own less than 5% of a C-Corp or S-Corp. Uh, if a 24-week covered period applies, uh, any owner, employee, or self-employed individual or general partner, the salary is capped at $20,833 per individual. And if the borrower has elected an eight-week cover, excuse me, covered period, for any owner, employee, or self-employed individual or general partner, the salary would cap be capped at the 15385 level. There is a required FTE calculation for each employee for the appropriate period, covered or alternative covered, you take the average number of hours paid per week, divide that by 40, round the total to the nearest tenth. The maximum for each employee is capped at one, or you can simply assign a one for employees who work 40 hours or more per week and 0.5 for employees who work fewer hours. There is a safe harbor for this, uh, for essentially reductions in forgiveness uh, based, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the safe harbor is based on uh, reductions in full-time equivalent employees for borrowers who are unable to return to the same level of business activity prior to February 15th due to compliance with the requirements or guidance between March 1st and December 31st that came from Health and Human Services, CDC, 
OSHA, or customer safety requirements related to COVID-19. So there is, as you can imagine, some wiggle room in there. Uh, if the borrower reduced its FTE employee levels in the period beginning February 15th and ending April 26th, and the borrower then restored those levels by not later than December 31st, so we still have some time, uh, th those, uh, those employee levels in the borrower's pay period that included February 15th, 2020. Uh, for any employees during the covered period, this, this is the six FTE reduction exceptions slide. Um, and these are those six exceptions. So the borrower made a good faith written offer to rehire an employee but was rejected by the employee. The employee was fired for cause or voluntarily resigned or voluntarily requested and received a reduction of their hours. As long as the borrower made a good faith written offer to restore any reduction in hours at the same salary or wages, but the employee rejected that, or the borrower was unable to hire a similarly qualified employee for unfilled positions by December 31st, 2020. Uh, any FTE reductions in these cases do not reduce the borrower's loan forgiveness. That's essentially what that means. So that's good news. So what's the payroll cost? Payroll costs are pretty straightforward from how I see it, probably not so straightforward uh, from the perspective of uh, payroll accountants, the IRS, um, but this is kind of a general idea of that. So basically compensation to employees whose principal place of residence is the United States falls under salary, wages, commissions, similar compensation, cash tips are the equivalent, based on employer records of past tips, or in the absence of those kinds of records, a reasonable good faith employer estimate of those kinds of tips, uh, payment for vacation, parental, family, medical, or sick leave, uh, allowance for separation or dismissal, payment for the provision of employee benefits consisting of group healthcare coverage, including insurance premiums and retirement, payment of state, and local taxes assessed on compensation of employees and for an independent contractor or sole proprietor, wage, commissions, income, or net earnings from self-employment or similar compensation. Payroll costs paid and payroll costs incurred during that 56 days or the 24 week 168 day cover period uh, that cannot, that, Either way, it can't go past December 31st. Uh, those payroll costs are considered paid on the day that paychecks are distributed or the borrow borrower originates an ACH credit transaction. Payroll costs are considered incurred on the day that the employee's pay is earned. Payroll costs incurred but not paid during the borrower's last pay period of the covered period are eligible for forgiveness if paid on or before the next regular payroll date. Otherwise, those payroll costs have to be paid during the covered period. Covered mortgage obligations. Um, so this, this would include payments of interests, not including prepayment or payment on principal for any business mortgage obligation on real or personal property incurred before February 15th. Uh, covered rent obligations. So business rent or lease payments pursuant to lease agreements for real or personal property enforced before February 15th, and then covered utility payments. And this would incorporate business payments for service for the distribution of electricity, gas, water, transportation, phone, internet access, as long as that service began before February 15th. And then eligible non-payroll costs cannot exceed 40% of the total forgiveness amount, uh, obviously based on the 60-40 split, um, and non-payroll costs that were paid, both paid and incurred only once are counted. So the summary for eligible costs and non-payroll, we're getting close to the end of this, I think. Uh, this is kind of an eye chart, but basically if the borrower is renting space, they sublease a portion of the space, then that borrower can only claim the net rent expense. In other words, for example, if you have a $7,000 per month rent with a sublease for $3,000 per month, 
they can only claim 4,000 for non-payroll expenses. If a borrower has a mortgage on the building and they lease 25% of the fair market value of the building, they can only claim 75% of the mortgage expense for forgiveness. So it's kind of, if you're getting rent money for that, you can't really consider it a cost. If the borrower shares the space with another business, they have to prorate the rent and utility payments in the same manner as the borrower's 2019 tax filings. If it's a new business, then uh, it's based on the borrower's expected 2020 tax filings. If the borrower is paying rent to a, to a real estate holding company, which they own, the borrower can only claim that portion of the rent that does not exceed the monthly interest payments on the loan for the covered period. If the borrower works out of their home, they can only include that portion of the non, of non-payroll expenses that were deductible on the borrower's 2019 tax filings or for a new business uh, for the covered period. You can also use your expected 2020 tax filings if you're a new business. There's a whole treasure trove of additional information in the PDF linked at the bottom here. Um, so the 30 the 3508S, the 3508S is the new loan forgiveness application. It's two pages. It, page one is submitted to the lender. It has the PPP forgiveness application and certification. Borrower demographics go on page two. Uh, there are The instructions are also included there. Uh, hopefully they're not as complicated as say, you know, putting together Ikea furniture, but um, it's the idea is that this should be relatively simple. The application is only for the following borrowers. If your PPP loan was $50,000 or less, and a borrower who together with affiliates received PPP loans totaling $2 million or greater, um, you're not gonna be able to use this form. So if you, even if, if it kind of came out to 50, amongst, you know, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, amongst you and your affiliates, and it gets to 2 million, you cannot use this form. Um, so basically the idea behind this is if you've got a $50,000 or less PPP loan, this is the way to go. There are, again, a whole lot of details on this at spa.gov slash PPP. The, the new loan forgiveness 3508EZ is three pages, separated into two sections. Um, pages one and two have to be submitted to the lender which is PPP, which is the forgiveness application itself and then certification. Um, page three is borrower demographics and page four is instructions. This application is only for the following borrowers. If you're self-employed and have no employees and you didn't reduce the salaries or wages of their employees by more than 25% and you didn't reduce the number of hours of their employee, number or hours of their employees, or experienced reductions in business activity as a result of health directives related to COVID-19 and did not reduce salaries or wages by more than 25%. Again, this all ties into the, the initial uh, purpose of the PPP program, which was to help uh, small businesses maintain payroll. The revised loan forgiveness application that's five pages long on the other hand, is separated into, you could probably all say it with me at this point, five sections. The first three pages are submitted to the lender, which is the PPP forgiveness application calculation, the certification and a schedule A. Uh, the fourth page is a schedule A worksheet. The fifth is the borrower demographics. And the sixth is the hopefully reasonably simple instructions. So as of August 10th, lenders could begin submitting loan forgiveness applications to the SBA. Once the loan forgiveness application is received by the lender, the lender has 60 days to submit a decision to SBA using SBA's payroll protection forgiveness platform. The lender has 90 days to make a decision and remit the forgiveness funds to the lender. If the SBA determines the borrower was an ineligible borrower, the loan will not be eligible for loan forgiveness. In this case, the lender is responsible for notifying the borrower. So you're gonna notice that most of these things are the borrower is working with the lender, the lender is working with SBA. And then SBA works with the lender and then the lender works with the borrower. Um, if only a portion of the loan is forgiven or if the forgiveness request is denied, any remaining balance must be repaid on or before the five-year maturity or two-year maturity of the loan. 
payments are deferred for borrower payments of principal, interest, and fees on PPP loans to the date that SBA remits the borrower's loan forgiveness amount to the lender, or if the borrower does not apply for loan forgiveness 10 months after the end of the borrower's loan forgiveness covered period. Just some helpful tips. You're going to need the loan forgiveness application and the instructions, much like IKEA uh, assembly. You should read those carefully um, and not just leap right into it. Um, there's a calculator and a calendar and some loan documents and supporting documentation that all go into this process. If you want to improve your forgiveness results, there are two methods for FTE calculation. There are two safe harbors and six FTE reduction exceptions that we've discussed. There's also the alternative covered period. I definitely recommend that you retain all your documents for six years. Um, generally, the rule is seven for, for documents, so it's probably not, uh, not a big, big surprise. These are some frequently asked questions, um, and then I think after this, we'll get right into the Q&A session. Uh, are non-payroll costs incurred prior to the covered period, but paid during the covered period? Are those eligible for loan forgiveness? Basically, are non-payroll costs inc incurred prior to the covered period eligible for loan forgiveness? Eligible business, the answer is yes. Eligible business mortgage interest costs, eligible business rent or lease costs, and eligible business utility costs that are incurred prior to the covered period, but paid during the covered period are eligible. Are non-payroll costs incurred during the covered period eligible for loan forgiveness if they are paid after the covered period? They are eligible for, non, for, for loan forgiveness, again, as long as they were incurred during the covered period and paid on or before the next regular billing date, even if the billing date is after the covered period. So that's, uh, that takes us to the Q&A section. Um, I'm going to try and pull up the, uh, the five initial questions that I received. And go through those. Let's see here. Um, hey, Rod, it's Victoria. I have a couple of questions that came through while um, you were presenting. Um, while you're looking okay. for your other ones, if you can answer a few, that would be great. Um, I know we're, I think we have a little more time if that's okay with you. Yeah. Awesome. So I'll start with, um, can IDA loans be used to pay off existing debt? No. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, and you can yeah. use it okay. for it. So there's actually a, uh, I can get right to that. So you can use these to pay fixed debts, payroll, accounts payable, and other bills that could have been paid. Had I'm sorry, that's the idle. Sorry, whoops, hang on. I jumped way too far back. Uh, ba -ba -ba. So you can use uh, eight, you can use the funds to pay up to eight weeks of payroll costs, including any benefits, and those funds can be used to pay interest on mortgages, rent, and utilities, but you can't use it to, to invest uh, for future expansion, essentially. Does that answer the question? I, I think they asked about the idle loan. Oh, okay. That's Maybe that's why I jumped to the idle. <laughs> that's okay. So uh, you can use idle funds for fixed debt, yes, payroll, accounts payable, and other bills that could have been paid had the disaster not occurred. So that was my initial answer about, I think maybe the reason I jumped to idle was because I've been, it's very hard to keep my brain either on the idle track or on the PPP track. So um, yeah, right. the, the um, answer is yes, you can pay fixed debts with that. Thank you. And I do have one other idle loan question that was right below it, which is perfect. It says, is the business supply for an idle loan earlier this year was approved, but did not use to choose to, to use the loan. Is it possible to apply again? 
I believe I believe so. In fact, the portal is still open. So for items, you, you could apply. In fact, if you received approval, you might just want to contact uh, the disaster loan folks at those at that contact information and say, look, you know, this is I was approved. You know, this is the situation. Here was my uh, my loan application number. I do need that loan after all. Is it still possible to to process that? Um, it's kind of an interesting thing because, like, basically, if you take if you if you accept the loan funds but you don't need them, you can pay the whole thing off with no no prepayment penalty. So, um, I'm not exactly sure. You you might end up because they may have closed that account that that application. You may have to go back in and reapply. But I would I would definitely fire off a, a question before I did that because you don't want to end up in a situation where you, where they've got multiple conflicting uh, loan documentation. Right. Right. Um, I have just a comment from Ron Mercer, and he said it was actually a relatively simple process with the easy form for forgiveness. Yeah, they've tried really hard to make it very very simple. Um, my. Uh, my experience of, of all things government, much like everyone else's, is that um, we have a way to complicate the simplest things, um, but that that process is, is, is try, has, we've really worked to try and make that simple. Um, and it kind of, it really all depends on the individual situation. I've talked to some folks who I thought it would be a relatively simple process, and there were a few wrinkles to their forgiveness process that uh, because of the way that funds were used, uh, that made it more difficult. Um, but it, it really all depends on, honestly, most of this depends on being able to document how you use the funds. But the easy process is, is literally supposed to be easy. So it's right there in the name. <laughs> I have a few more. Is it okay if I ask those and then we'll go into the ones that were already asked prior to this webinar? Yep. Awesome. Um, can a PPP recipient select a forgiveness period other than eight week, the eight week or 24 week options? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Sure, it says, can a PPP recipient select a forgiveness period other than the eight week or 24 week option? Um, she did write, he did write that since a sole proprietor schedule C filler may not technically have any employees, what support needs to be submitted for forgiveness? So if you used if you used all of the funds in less than eight weeks, it doesn't matter. You're still under the eight week rule. If you used all the funds adequately in less than 24 weeks, it still applies as long as you're not going beyond those terms. Did that I, answer the question? I I hope so. I so, um, so we have another those question. Are, those, are lim those are upper limiting factors. Like it's like the speed limit. As long as you're not going over that speed limit, I think you're okay. Okay. Generally speaking. Are employer expenses like FICA matched covered? Yes. Okay. Um, also, Ron Mercer, thank you for your feedback here. It says um, the only payroll tax expense allowed is for the ER portion of PAUC. What? Um, so we have, do you have, so we, issues, oh, I'm sorry. Are we talking um, idle or PPP, sorry. I was just, it's just a comment. I'm gonna keep going with these questions so we can get them all in. Okay. Um, do you have to submit documentation with the 350H8S if loan was under 50,000? you're definitely going to have to repeat that one okay preferably do you, slower <laughs> do you have to no problem do you have to submit documentation with the 358 s if loan was under fifty thousand? i don't think that honestly the answer to that is the bank is going to try and use whatever form is most likely to get you forgiveness so if they, if the bank is telling you it, you're more likely to get forgiveness with using form, whichever form, then they're probably 
right about that. Um, but it, you don't have to use, it's kind of one of those things like you can, you can only use the 3, 350.08S under those certain circumstances. Like if you fall outside of those, it doesn't make sense to, you, you're not allowed to use it. But if you're eligible to use that, then, then it would probably be the easiest route to forgiveness. Thank you. Um, just a side note too, this will be available for everyone on our website afterwards and um, scrantonchamber.com and all of our other social media outlets for you to use and view. Um, I have another question quick. Do you have any information about the deductibility of the payroll expenses on a company's tax return? Is a company that gets forgiveness allowed to use those same expenses as a deductible item on their return? Wow. Um, so I can't specifically give you tax advice, um, but all of the, honestly, the, the, that sort of question is something that as you're filling that paperwork out, you should definitely reach out to your lender and say, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. Does, does this fit in that box? Okay. Uh, wasn't the payroll amount required lowered from 75% to 60%? It was, um, the, the, but the folks who will be able to, to, to answer whether a specific loan falls under bucket A or bucket B or how that, how, what makes the most sense for proceeding is something that you can work out with the bank. The bank is def the good news is is that both both the borrower and the bank are definitely on the same team when it comes to trying to accomplish uh, the terms for forgiveness of the loan. So they 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 are definitely incentivized to have SBA forgive the loan and repay the bank, and you're incentivized to apply for that forgiveness and have SBA do that. So. Um, the good news is in all of this is that it's it's not like you know as long as you've used the funds correctly in the bank the bank will be able to to help you process that in a way that is likely to result in forgiveness great and then our last one that just came through um then we'll go to the others that you have already um, since a sole proprietor proprietor Schedule C filer may not te technically have any employees. What support needs to be submitted for forgiveness? Uh, this is for a PPP loan. Um, so the answer is, is what, you know, how the funds were used. If you can document how the funds were used and you paid salary to yourself, then that would qualify as long as you can document that. Great. Is that all the questions that just popped up? That just popped up, yep. I think we are ready for the um, submitted ones that came before um, our webinar oh, wait, started. This one, this thing, Chris Martin, how does the borrower have insurance with you? Oh, Chris okay, just... So, I'm sorry, say that again? Chris just, just um, did submit a quick question. When does a borrower have until to apply for forgiveness? Uh, for P uh, hang on just a second. So you have until, uh, t t t uh, hang on. I keep trying to remember specific dates, but it's just like being in history class. I always forget all except the big ones for 1776. <laughs> um, here. So you would have to apply for loan forgiveness. Um, so payment, so payments on, on this are deferred, uh, on all of it 
to the date that SBA remits the borrower's loan forgiveness amount to the lender. So, um, I mean, honestly, I can't imagine that we're going to go past much past the end of the year without most of these things being filed. Um, I, but I, I honestly, I, I, I don't have that answer right in front of me, like a specific date, but it's usually based on, based on a time frame from disbursement date to, uh, and then there's a time frame that's built in after that, after appli after application for, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's there's basically a like you're gonna you're gonna want to apply as soon as you've used the funds. Essentially, you're gonna want to apply for forgiveness. Now, some people are waiting to see how all of this basically shakes out, but I'm gonna tell you right now that. The simplest answer, in my opinion, is if you are looking at having used those funds already, and they have, and and you're fairly certain that you have used them in ways that would qualify you for forgiveness, you should reach out to the lender and start that process. Um, I do know that there has been some some well. Let's wait and see exactly how all of this shakes out to that. But if honestly, from my standpoint. Uh, from the, you know, looking at it, if I were a small business owner, I would apply as soon as I've completed using the funds and can document it. I wouldn't wait forever, I guess is what I'm saying. All right, great, thank you. So should I shift over to the, uh, to the questions? Yes, please. Okay, so the first question on here, of course, is from the CPA, which I am, I am not, and I'm specifically not allowed to give uh, tax uh, or legal advice, but um, the question is under the 24 week payroll period, how does comparison to the base period for actual payroll and FTE work? And I honestly, I'm not certain. Um, my understanding of it is in, in, in my non-CPA fairly limited way is that, um, in either situation, it, it works exactly the same way. So if you're basing it on an eight-week period, it's the same essentially as if you were on a 24-week period. Um, it just kind of depends on which bucket you're, you're, you fall into. But you have, but you know, the standards are the same that are that are part of that requirement. The only difference is eight weeks versus 24. Uh, the second question is. Uh, how to handle a situation due to a government mandate on reduced operation um, and hasn't been able to hire back the same number of employees as before the shutdown. Uh, the, so they're asking basically, are they penalized even though they can't possibly rehire to the same staff levels? And the answer to that is um, that you shouldn't be um, based on the sort of things that we talked about earlier where there are various safe harbors and exemptions to those things. Um, so we had talked about um, the FTE calculation method and both of those methods, the two safe harbors and the six FTE reduction exceptions, and then the alternative covered period. So there's, there's, there's definitely some wiggle room there. Um, again, when you're filing this paperwork, if you have any questions about this specifically, work with the bank because you guys are going to be you know, both paddling in the same direction, essentially. Um, the third question is, how do the self-employed LLC members address non-payment of payroll? Um, is it smarter to wait to file for forgiveness in 2021 within the 10 months to see what your 2020 tax liability may be? Um, it depends on whether you think the 19 or the 20 uh, makes more sense for you, perhaps. Um, Although I, I honestly am not, I, I can't advise somebody on which set of returns to use. Again, um, and I probably can't stress this enough, you definitely want to ask these questions of the bank because they're uh, of, of your lender. Um, the if there's non-payment of payroll, um, then that's definitely going to affect uh, forgiveness, but you're going to want to try and make sure that you have either those exceptions. You can, you can fit it in through one of those 
exceptions that we talked about, um, the various safe harbors and reduction exceptions, or you're going to want to uh, to try to to not expend that money on non-payroll, um, so that you have it in hand um, in case it doesn't get uh, in case in case it doesn't qualify for for forgiveness unless you want to take it on as a as a loan payment. Uh, let's see, what is the last day to use the PPP loan? Um, it's either the eight or the 24 weeks from the day of disbursement. At least that one's fairly straightforward. Um, so there's, a, there's another example here where they say they started with three FTE and had three FT during a small portion of the PPP loan, but then one person found a different job and they were reduced to two FTE, but haven't replaced that position. So, and they don't plan to, to hire another one until 2021. Um, does that, their question is, does that ruin the forgiveness? It doesn't as long as it fits within one of those, those uh, FTE reduction exceptions. So for instance, as long, and, and the key to all of this is, can you document it? And that, and, and is my, and my understanding of that is that if you can get something from that person that says, this is why they left and you haven't been able to hire someone else yet because then that may, may still qualify for forgiveness. Um, the last question is, how long does the borrower have to apply for loan forgiveness? And when do they have to begin making payments? So uh, that falls under that 10 month rule in the first place uh, for you know how long you have within the 10 months. And then, um, but again, if you think you qualify for forgiveness, you should go ahead and go forward with that. Um, but I noticed that this is a bank, a question from a bank. Uh, so, uh, I would definitely anybody, any banker or CPA who has questions that are specific to these sorts of things that are kind of beyond the realm of what, uh, generally speaking, uh, is spoken to in the SOP. Um, and, uh, you know, or there are specific questions. If you, uh, if you want, I can. I can shoot those to our resident experts um, in, uh, in in the lender relations specialist department uh, of the agency, and hopefully that uh, they can give you a more according to Hoyle answer. But uh, but basically, if you if you don't apply for, for if you if you apply for loan forgiveness, then the payments will be based off of when all of that documentation comes back in and says this is how much is not being forgiven. Therefore, you owe this amount of money to the bank. Um, if you don't apply for loan forgiveness, then all of that would be would basically become due once you're no longer able to apply for for loan forgiveness, which is, I guess, past the ten month period. I, I hope that answers that question, sort of, kinda. But uh, a lot of this kind of it's um. I'm not going to lie to you. It gets a little complicated, especially as soon as you start talking about um, uh, things that fall outside of the standard uh, buckets that people fall into for forgiveness. But I think the vast majority of folks are going to find that that it's pretty. It's a pretty straightforward process with the bank once they actually start the application process. Thank you, Rob. I just have two more questions. We have about five minutes left, if that's okay. No um, problem. I received a PPP loan for less than $50,000 and I am self-employed. Which form do I use? The 358S or the 3508EZ? Which, whichever one accomplishes the minimum level of documentation that you have to provide to qualify for forgiveness is the, is the basic answer. But the more the the slightly more uh, nuanced answer is when you're when you're filing that paperwork with your bank, talk to your lender. They will they will help guide you because they definitely want you to qualify for forgiveness. And if there's a requirement for more documentation, you'll go with the form that the set of forms that require that additional documentation. I mean, at least that's what I would do because I would be trying to get forgiveness. <laughs> right, right. Um, so we are a nonprofit and have already received PPP loan less than 50000 
Um, can we also apply for the idle? You can, however, you can't use, uh, so you can't use idle funds for the same thing that you use PPP funds for. What I've seen a lot of businesses do is they use the idle as a working capital loan and the PPP to cover salary. And that keeps them, you know, in the, in the, in the optimum position to get maximum forgiveness on the PPP loan and to, to make sure that they're not running afoul of the requirement not to use the idle loan for the same thing that they use the PPP loan for. And, Great, the, idle so and the, PPP, the idle and the PPP do have some interactivity in that, in that way. Um, so, uh, and, and the amount of the idle affects how much PPP forgiveness you may be eligible for. So I would be very, um, I would, I would talk to, to the, if you already have a PPP loan, I would, I would speak to the lender about that and how it might affect, uh, forgiveness. The other thing is, is that you can always apply for an idle and then choose not to take the funds. Um, so you know if you if you were to apply today and get an approval and then you went to the bank and said i've been approved for this much under the idle program how how would how does that affect my ppp loan the bank should be able to help you kind of back of the envelope work that out right that and that was a question from wildflower and she unfortunately um, had missed the po the portion before which she can go back and, and watch but thank you for answering that And I think that's it for us today. Um, Rob, thank you so much again for um, being here with us and presenting this information to everyone. I, I certainly don't pretend to be an expert. I, I try to, I think we're all kind of just trying to muddle through this as best as possible. I think even Congress keeps encountering things where, um, you know, constituents are bringing concerns to them that they may have to go back and, and address legislatively. So um, there are, you know, there are some folks who fall into some very uh, interesting uh, corners of this legislation and, and the funding pieces of this. So uh, I would definitely say stay tuned. It's been a, it's been a really wild ride. Uh, this program, I think, has done more lending in the last year um, under PPP and IDLE than our agency has done in the entire history of the agency of all the years combined. Um, it's a, it's been a, the biggest undertaking in the agency's history. Um, we're a, we're not a huge agency, um, so it's been a, it's been a big lift, and a lot of folks have 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 been, you know, doing doing all that they can, even just to understand all of these things. Um, this is probably the most profound piece of legislation I've seen uh, since the Affordable Care Act, which was probably the biggest uh, change in legislative history in my lifetime um and even then like you know that 2000 or so page document there was the sound of it hitting all of these different agencies policymakers desks kind of at the same time and then they had time to figure all of that and implement it whereas in the in the case of these loan programs we didn't have that luxury to to try and uh make sure that you know all everything was exactly Every dot I, every every I dotted T crossed before we had we had to start building we had to start driving the bus basically while we were still making sure the the bus had enough air in the tires if you will. So um, the the goal here has been to help small businesses. I, I think that uh, although it is it can be complicated, uh, that that it's that it's certainly doing that, and that every piece of legislative change that I have seen and all of the policy stuff that's come out of it. Has, has generally been to the benefit of the small business borrower who needed these funds uh, to help their business and, you know, during this pandemic. Great, thank you. And I think you have a slide down there with your information below. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, and thank I, you everyone for attending. And I, and I will actually uh, PDF this and send you a copy in case anybody needs it. Wonderful, thank you. I hope everyone has a great day. And again, thank you so much for attending and um, we'll see you all soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Take care.